the joy never ends. Are you tired of arcades with no soul? Then you need to come to the place your mom hates. The wonder never ends. That's right. At Neon Arcade, we take the fun to the extreme, man. We even have a dinosaur. We have prizes from all of your favorite video game mysteries. Neon Arcade, home of your favorite lost media. If you join us on opening day, you can get a free copy of Mario Kart on the Super Nintendo. This will never end. sucks. It's really quite sad, honestly. All these small businesses of wonder and amusement, reduced to a mere corpse of its former self. You have all this promise of pleasure that will last forever, but yet, here we are. <sighs> it's too common. Go-karts and disappointment. The Mario Kart series has had a long history of disappointment. From trying to finish that last lap of the race in first, to getting taken out by a Koopa shell at the last possible moment, to alleged secret characters who never even once stepped foot on the racetrack. Let's go racing! It's Super Mario Kart 25 Madness! It's Super Mario the ass! Turn the track into a giant mud pit! Oh, I mix it up with a big boy! She's how to his big foot's coming from us! You'll see go kind of really quick! Watch your own spin out of Peel's turbo shell! Turbo! Tonight, on Lost in the Files, we explore the urban legends of the Mario Kart series. From the streets of our childhood, to the raceway, to the wonders of the mind. Mario Kart 64 is without a doubt one of the most 90s things to ever exist. Its graphics have aged like milk and the controls are pretty clumsy, but I gotta say it must have done something right because it holds a lot of nostalgia for the many that grew up on this game. It's actually my favorite, believe it or not. I love how quirky and weird the graphics look. This game hosted its fair share of sleepovers over the years in the 90s, but I will say even if you were an introverted kid, you probably got interested and wondered, are there any secrets hiding within this game? Well, Mario Kart has had a lot of different games across many different systems. It's one of the most famous series ever. Most have heard of it. So we thought it would be fun to compile our favorite urban legends surrounding the Mario Kart series. What kind of secrets hide on the racetrack? Well, let's find out. In 2007, 
YouTube was new, and many who had grown up with Mario Kart 64 were now sharing their personal secrets with the world. New tricks on the courses, secret item areas, and even characters who never made it into the final game. But rumors would also emerge of a secret unlockable character found in Bowser's castle. Secret characters were far more common back in the 90s, as a bonus for playing so much of the game. Nowadays, about every character needs to be advertised to get the game to sell as much as possible. But that wasn't the case in the 90s. There were hidden characters hiding all the time, which kept the games relevant even long after the release. The early days of YouTube was revolutionary for now being able to share real video footage of these old tricks being true and doable, and which rumors were just untrue and didn't even work. However, despite having actual footage often being the proof needed to find out if a rumor from 10 to 20 years ago was a hoax, that didn't stop many from staging and modifying videos to make fake scenarios on how to get these characters. There are so many that turned out to be true, and many that turned out to be false. Hey, that would make for a good series. Look, it was either I did this or poor quality UFO videos from 2007. Actually, that's not such a bad idea. So in 2007, videos would start emerging online of this rumored playable character hiding deep within the Bowser's Castle racetrack. The stage featuring death traps, lava, and even a choir to sing about the descent of terror you are about to embark on. And hiding inside of this madhouse was an enemy so terrifying and so crazy, he had to be locked up by Bowser himself just to protect those that followed him. This is Marty. <laughs> really? His name is Marty? The dude from the gas station? Okay, all right. This is the dumbest rumor we've had in the series yet. Okay. Okay, so Marty could have existed prior to the internet at the sleepovers. But he got his notoriety in the late 2000s when uploading YouTube videos of Mario games was a new concept. Now, where did the name Marty come from? It's not really known, but it's possible it came from a video that hit YouTube in 2007. Play McElveen uploaded a video to the site that would send this mystery into an all new light. An off cam video showing him doing ritual S techniques such as circling around the Bowser statues several times and running the racetrack in reverse. Marty would be free. Oh my. Now the validity could be questioned. The video came out in April, but it was also April Fool's Day. However, there was a second video that strangely came out a few days earlier. This one had a proper capture card or such, so now we could get a better look. But there was no sound. The results? were the same. Many would try this themselves, yet despite following the video exactly, nothing happened. All the mystery is gone in vain. So the years would pass and this mystery would become a nice piece of history in early YouTube mysteries. Equipment and data miners would become more talented over the years, and other fans would become just far more dedicated leading to new revelations surrounding the over-decade-long mystery. Supper Mario Brothers Broth, an extremely credible blog that concerns itself with the most unexplored, most unknown, and most obscure depths of the Mario franchise, showed how the texture used for Marty was actually never green. He was actually the same color as the other swamp enemies in Bowser's Castle, and it's actually the lighting that causes him to appear green. The bigger mystery is really not if he's in the game, that was false. But what exactly did he do to get behind those bars in the first place?
Okay, so while entertaining, Marty might be one of the silliest urban legends out there. So instead, let's talk about something with real-world consequences. Piracy has lasted almost as long as video games have existed. Going back to the floppy disks and the VHS tapes, the classic tale of getting an illegal copy of the game, whether it's before release, an unofficial replication, or a knockoff you didn't even know was made without the company's consent, because it looks just that good. Piracy has been around for a very long time, and many games would install anti-piracy measures into the games to avoid them from functioning normally. If the game detected that it was being played on illegitimate hardware of some sort, sometimes the game would lock the player, say, out of completing the first stage, or even loading up the game at all. However, the anti-piracy measures would sometimes get strange and sometimes morbid. Some games would be programmed with ominous messages, or even in some cases, as creepy faces or otherwise to scare those that got their hands on these copies. Take this clip from Spyro the Dragon. This is real. I'm sorry Spyro, but you seem to be playing a hacked version of this game. This may be an illegal copy. Since this copy has been modified, you may experience problems that would not occur on a legal copy. Check this out. This is the 2004 classic, Mario Kart DS. However, this is actually not a real copy. This is actually a bootleg or knockoff, meaning it was not released by the original company. Nintendo has had a long battle against knockoffs and piracy over the years. <sighs> So many memories with this game. It makes sense why it was such a blast. I mean, you had all those tracks, the music, the graphics, all those wonderful iconic characters, and the costumes they'd wear. I mean, heck, just look at Peach when we came out. I don't know about you, but back in my day, that's what you called hot. <sighs> I don't know about you, but I'd like to take a ride on it. <laughs> what the heck was that? In 2021, a video would surface on YouTube titled Mario Kart Wii Anti-Piracy Screen. It had some disturbing content. During the early 2020s, many different anti-piracy screens from many games would surface online, showing what kind of measures companies would do to prevent theft. Kill screens, creepy messages, and deleting files. These videos had it all. Yeah, I got me an illegal copy of Mario Kart Wii. <laughs> the most famous of these was uploaded by Joey Pearl. He would share repeated encounters with Mario Party DS anti-piracy screens. The player would die in many different fashions and be greeted with a recurring message. Piracy is no party. With sirens in the background. I can only assume that this is the looming authorities waiting to take you away for playing unfair. <laughs> so, 
So piracy is definitely no party. It makes sense. If you have a game you want to play, you should go out and buy the game legally. It supports the developer trying to help their family. It supports the publisher trying to make more games. And you support yourself too, because you get to make all these great memories with this game, and these memories are going to stick with you the rest of your life. You can share this game with your own kids, your family, your friends, online, your girlfriend. It's just such a great thing. Video games are such a beautiful medium. They're a great escape. They spark creative freedoms. They're awesome. But unfortunately, in the more recent years, there's been a lot of moral gray areas that have arose from games simply getting older. Games that are, say, 15 to 20 years old are not games you can just find at a retail store. So, you resort to the secondhand market. And unfortunately, a lot of these games are just so popular that they have outlandish prices. There's just so many listings, and none of them are at a good price, and many just can't afford them. So, maybe you check, say, a video game convention. It's the same story. It's not uncommon to see games that are, that are sold for $100 or $200. Not everybody can afford that. And it's not the fault of the vendor, it's just the public demand. So, you want to support the publisher. So you check, say, a modern day downloadable service, say the eShop or a virtual console. And unfortunately, not every game you try to find to buy legally are on there. Some of them used to be, say, Mario Kart DS, it used to be on the Wii U eShop or Virtual Console, but that service has been also discontinued, and now you can't legally purchase the game. So what many will do is they will download the game illegally from the internet for free, so that way they can still play the game. And you have to ask the moral question, is this right? Well, as we all know, piracy is no party. that was good stress relief but truthfully I don't think developers really care that much if you're pirating their games publishers maybe I'm not a lawyer but you know at the end of the day we're all just trying to have a good time and make the most of life so go by what feels right in your heart you know I'm not here to take any sides on the matter just try to make the most of your life and have a great time but remember at the end of the day piracy is no party so a lot of these happen to be fake, trying to get in on the whole haunted, creepy game type idea. Now some of these are real, but some of these creepy blood type videos are fake, unfortunately including Mario Kart Wii. While I do love this kind of stuff, it does present a new problem of there now being a lot of fake information out there regarding anti-piracy in video games. Okay, now for something that isn't fake. In the 1990s, Nintendo would team up with British video game developer Argonaut Games. Despite being outside of Japan, Argonaut would develop some impressive technology that would catch Nintendo's eye. The two would team up to create Star Fox. Using the power of this Super FX chip, the world would get a glimpse of the 3D technology awaiting them in the future. It was groundbreaking. For something so revolutionary, you'd think these two would have had a long partnership, but no. The two would work together to create Star Fox 2, aiming for release in 1995. The game was nearly complete, ready to leave the hangar for a summer release. But at essentially the last minute, Nintendo pulled the plug on the project due to the new Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn, 
selling better than thought in the summer of 95. Those at Nintendo didn't want the older hardware competing with the new, far more impressive hardware. It doesn't look good for the brand, so the decision was made to cancel Star Fox 2 and move forward with all the attention on the then looming Nintendo 64. We will not compromise, we will live the game through our hands. We will be in control of something. This didn't seem to go over well with Argonaut and Nintendo's relations in retrospect. The game was around 95% done. Which brings us to Yoshi Racing. Likely sometime in the 90s, Argonaut would approach Nintendo about creating a 3D Yoshi game, which focused on racing. Not much is known, but Nintendo would reject this offer. It is speculated by Jez San, the founder of Argonaut, that it was rejected due to Nintendo not wanting third parties to use their characters. Interesting, given their work on Star Fox. Nintendo would even hire Argonaut employees who lived in Japan to work on the game, possibly leaving a bad impression on Argonaut as well. The untold drama between these two is fascinating, but little documented info has been made public about it. Was it civil? Was it petty? Was it a mutual split? Who knows? It is actually believed that the cancellation of this Yoshi game was the final blow to Nintendo and Argonaut's relations. What is a fact is that Argonaut would jump onto the competitor PlayStation and create an original IP, Croc, Legend of the Gabos. However, even this series has its fair share of mysteries on what is actually true. It is believed that this game came from the cancelled Yoshi prototype, with Yoshi being reworked into the character Croc. Jez San, the founder of Argonaut, believes that Super Mario 64 had the look and feel of their Yoshi game, and would further state that Mario series creator Shigeru Miyamoto would go on to personally apologize to him for not picking up the Yoshi game. Followed by an applause from the crowd. While a good story, it has sparked debate on the validity of it, due to it changing over the years. No disrespect intended, I'd love to talk to him about it. But Sans has before said the connection between the games were possibly coincidental, and that Nintendo was already working on something similar before Yoshi Racing had even been presented. Strange. However, his story could be true. There may be even a sliver of inspiration from that Yoshi Racing game in Mario 64. The Croc series itself has had a history of taking people's word on things, only for things to turn out to be a total fabrication. There was a whole third Croc game that we believed was real for years, and it turned out to be a total hoax. It's crazy how much drama can come from a little Yoshi game demo. If there is one thing we can confirm as fact though, is that in 2020, during the massive dump of Nintendo files to the internet without their knowledge, the Giga leak as it came to be known, inside of a folder with prototype models, hit a Super FX model of Mario's Dinosaur Pal, Yoshi. Did this have any connection to Yoshi Racing? I don't know. Might have been for testing. But it is a fascinating turn in the history of this game and the connection between Nintendo and Argonaut. So we've gone from character hoaxes to flat out canceled games. It sucks how much society has pushed out imaginative creations in favor of it being the norm to instead complain about others' achievements on social media. The perspective of accepting whatever is forced upon us doesn't have to be the case. Remember, you are a creator too. Who would have thought that Nintendo could have brought video games back into the mainstream after the video game crash of the 1980s? It was seen as a dead medium. Atari was burying unsold cartridges in the desert, but they advertised it as a toy, threw some creative marketing and got it into the homes of many. Now the industry is even more profitable than the movie industry. 
the market was so oversaturated with games that weren't very good. Focus on quality, to where you'll still be talking about these games 40 years later. Speaking of movies, that's also how many of the best films get made. Instead of taking what society saw as okay, they did something different from what everyone else did, that people really wanted or needed and made their lives more enjoyable as a result. Could you imagine a world without imagination followed by action? There would be no Disney World, no Nintendo, no movies, no fun. It's tragic that we live in a world where most of the structure has been made for profits and convenience, but social media, dating apps, and the ability to purchase at our fingertips has ironically made for a more lonely society. We have the ability to travel almost anywhere across our country, but there's so little worth travel. Places like fun centers, malls, and heck, even Blockbuster gave people something worth their time. They create experiences. We can blame the economy. We can blame streaming. But the biggest consistent reality is, they didn't just become retro, they became dated. A dated product is hard to maintain and make profit. However, remember this, in a world full of corpses of businesses killed by a select few companies, you still see those mini time capsules of a time that was. History is amazing, from the remnants of tribes that once were, to the buildings of civilizations that may have known of a deeper connection, we don't. There is so much creativity and passion put into many of those that dared. For good or for bad, they challenged the society normal. Whether it's a digital game or a physical adventure, the world needs passionate creators, more than ever. We've seen so many places close without a proper or even lackluster replacement. Instead of everyone becoming old and bitter, talking about how games were finished, movies were quality, and there was more to do, the world needs reason to smile with those you love, fun things to do, memories to be made, whether that creation ends up timeless or not. Instead of living in the past forever, maybe it's time we truly feel that present moment around us and start shaping a world where we are excited for what the future can truly bring. Because when you put everything on your phone, there's less to drive to. Do you or someone you know have a mystery you would like to see featured on the channel? Then reach out to me on one of my social platforms. You can also find me on Patreon. The support here really makes a huge difference, so really, thank you. Now let's see who else made this episode come to life.
Thank <laughs> you.